Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for being here on today. So I'm here today to present on diversity and development matters. So when you look at this image, what do you see? Most people would say that they see several white people, a couple of diverse faces, and the group is, of course, led by a white man, right? You may be wondering, why did you just show us that image? What was the point of you showing us that image, right? Well, the fact of the matter is that in 2015, I did a Google search for higher education development officers at predominantly white institutions, and that was the first image that came up, right? And all of the other images looked almost identical to that image. So, at the time I was working for development operation, and my then supervisor said, I'm gonna take you to development officer meetings, and I'm also gonna take you to fundraising professional development meetings, and I want for you to do two things. I want for you, one, to pay attention to who's in the room, and two, to pay attention to the interactions that occur. Surprisingly, the rooms are almost always filled with white people, right? Maybe I was the only one surprised at that. <laughs> uh, but of course, it was predominantly women, but almost all of the development teams were led by white men, right? So I kind of thought this was shocking and started to think about the fact that higher education is diversifying and what are the experiences of African Americans within the field of development in higher education. So that's my dissertation study was born. I looked at the experiences of frontline fundraisers at predominantly white institutions. Um, I had a total of 11 participants, and they all were employed at an association of American University member institutions. Um, nine worked at public institutions, one was at a private institution, and one was currently in higher education but transferred um, to work at a cultural center in the Northeast, right? And so in this study, my research was kind of grouped into three buckets. So one, how they conceptualized their role in higher education. Two, how, how they interacted and how they managed to navigate the terrain of higher education leadership um, at predominantly white institutions. And three, how their race influenced their work, if it influenced it at all, right? And so oftentimes they had so much to say about this topic, right? They talked about different instances of oppression. They talked about how it was difficult to sometimes manage the teams, etc. But that's just anecdotal, right? You want to know why is this actually an issue? Well, if you look at the background, only 11% of 30,000 registered fundraisers are minority. And that's according to case. Another study said that 17% of all um, development officers are minorities at AAU institutions, but very few of them are frontline fundraisers, right? And so when we think about this, this is important because the landscape of higher education is changing rapidly. We're increasing the number of diverse students that we have at our universities. Thus, our alumni population are increasing, right? They're increasingly diverse. And when we think about this, in 2040, when UF is ready to launch that $10 billion campaign, we're no longer just going to be dependent on white men for our philanthropic dollars, right? We're going to have to lead our, our increasingly diverse alums. And oftentimes, they had traumatic experiences at their institutions, right? Minorities, LGBTQ populations, they experienced traumatic uh, experiences here. And they had to navigate those. So it's important for us to start having diversity that mirrors those groups so that we can create trust, so that we can show them the progress that we're making in higher education and how we're moving forward. So the first question, how did they conceptualize their roles? I think most of the fundraisers in the room will agree that you all are bridge builders, right? You connect the philanthropists to philanthropy opportunities. You connect donors, alums, friends and family to programs that they feel passionate about. You connect people to their passions, right? And they view themselves the same way. They say, we're bridge builders, just like all the other fundraisers. We are connectors. We get people from one point and help them identify their passion and connect them to areas that they can get involved and contribute financially to. Secondly, they saw themselves as hope raisers, right? They said, we are literally the foundation for all of the great work, the innovation that comes forth from higher education. We're fundraising for the next professor who might discover the cure for diabetes or for cancer. We're fundraising for the next student who might be a doctor or a lawyer. We're providing scholarships for the next president of the United States, right? So we're literally the foundation of all the innovation that comes forth from the university. 
And finally, they talked about how they had an important role in making sure that philanthropic communities of colors are not overlooked, right? And they talked about how oftentimes they would approach diverse alums and create healing spaces for people to have those critical conversations about their experiences. And they said that oftentimes alums would say, well, we saw an all-black development team and we didn't feel comfortable talking about our experiences. We felt like they would be ignored. But now that we see more diversity on these teams, we're able to have those critical conversations and re-engage with the universities, right? And so they talked about creating these healing spaces and really making sure that philanthropists of color, those communities of color are not overlooked in the process of development. So next, when they were thinking about how to navigate the landscape of predominantly white institutions, they talked about it as being an isolating experience oftentimes, right? Overwhelmingly, they all said that usually they were the only diverse person on their development team. And as you can see from this picture, right, he looks like he's not privy to whatever is going on. <laughs> and that's how they said they felt. They felt like they were isolated. Like they were oftentimes looked to be the voice of diversity for all diverse people, right? And create these creative ideas because they were diverse. Um, a couple participants said in their almost 20 year careers, they had been the only diverse person at the development table for almost their entire careers, right? It's pretty frightening. Then the second point that they really talked about is a more traumatic form of isolation. They talked about how they felt isolated in perspective and how people oftentimes overlooked their emotions and how they were feeling. So one participant talked about how at the time when the Trayvon Martin verdict came out, she was pregnant with a son. And she said she went to work and she was a bit frustrated and her colleagues came to her and said, you look flustered, like what's going on, are you okay? She said, well, I'm concerned about raising my son in the current context um, of our country, right? You know, the Trayvon Burton just came out, and I'm just a little bit concerned about that. They looked at her and they said, well, we're raising daughters, and we're not worried about them getting assaulted, right? And she said because of experiences like this that occurred over and over, she felt like she had to lobotomize her racial identity from her professional identity, that she could not bring her full self to work. And many of the participants echoed this in various forms and fashions. Next, they talked about how they're aware of the historical perception of black people, right? They reluctantly called it baggage. They say, yes, it, it feels like baggage sometimes. There's a historical perception about us. Um, for instance, if you were to see a large group of black people outside of Emerson, most people would probably be like, what's going on out there, right? But if you were to see a group of white people, would be like, oh, it's just, it's just another day, right? Because that's the norm. <laughs> if I were to yell across the Emerson courtyard to one of my friends and say, hello, uh, it would be, did you have a drink this morning? Like, are you okay? Whereas if a white man were to do it, it's just he's trying to get his friend's attention, right? And so they become aware of this perception and the baggage that occurs with it, and thus they learn how to coach and code switch, okay? And so an example of code switching in my personal life um, is some of my colleagues and I, we were joking around about fun interview questions, and I told them that if they were to ask me about a fun interview question, my answer would be, for, for that interview question of what's your favorite song, my answer would be, life is a highway, I'm gonna run it all night. <laughs> right? That is not my favorite song. <laughs> To relate to the mainstream in an attempt to be validated in our responses, we oftentimes will pull from the mainstream and come up with answers that most people in the room would know. Because if I may name my favorite song, most people probably wouldn't know it. Sometimes it changes based on the day, right? Um, and so they learned how to code switch and really coach people through their race and through their experiences. And so I've given you a lot of information, right? And it can be seen as a downer, right? But I want to talk briefly about how we can get the change that we want to see, right? What are some examples of things that we can do to be proactive to help advance diversity in our field? So one, we have to remember to create safe spaces for people, right? Safe spaces for people to bring their full identity, to bring their full selves to work. We have to make sure that when we see oppression or when we see injustice or inequality that we speak up. One of the participants mentioned that one time her colleague said something extremely racist in a meeting and she looked at her supervisor and her supervisor was silent. And she said that silence caused her to feel powerless in that moment. 
So we have to make sure that we're advocates and that we stand up for what's right and that we stand up for what is just and what is fair. So a couple of recommendations are to conduct an analysis of hiring practices, right? Whiteness reproduces whiteness, right? So we have to make sure that we have diverse people on hiring committees. We have to make sure that we're also using diverse language um, and language that will appeal to greater populations. Next, we have to create workshops on office culture and biases. Oftentimes, people are just unaware of certain things, right? They're unaware of microaggressions. They're unaware of their own biases. And to do these workshops and to educate them causes them to confront themselves and oftentimes self-police, so this is important. Provide leadership development workshops. We have to remember that leadership development cannot be left within the Good Old Boys Club. We have to promote leadership development to all people so that all people have an equal opportunity to rise through the ranks. Next, invest in affinity groups on campus. Oftentimes, these are the only places where people of color, LGBTQ people, can bring their whole identity to work, right? I will not tell an affinity group that my favorite song is Life is a Holiday, <laughs> right? And then next, support professional development and affirm their identities. It's important that we support people, that we support people grow personally, professionally, um, in their field as well in, in their personal life. And we have to affirm that identities and promote an inclusive environment to where people can bring their full selves. There's a great, great quote that I like that says, until the great mass of people shall be filled with a sense of responsibility for each other's welfare, social justice can never be attained. We have to feel a sense of responsibility to each other. We cannot just let underrepresented people speak for themselves and speak up for themselves. We have to be advocates and speak up when we see injustice, speak up when we see a lack of an inclusive environment. And we have to be advocates and promote a more inclusive culture um, and work alongside each other. And we have to remember that our goal is to go greater, right? Go greater in that gold standard sense of customer service, go greater in our philanthropic endeavors, go greater to number five and go greater to the top five, and also go greater in terms of diversity and inclusion. Thank you all so much.